Hello and welcome to Happier, a podcast where we talk about strategies and suggestions for how to be happier. This week we'll talk about why it's helpful to ask people how they know you've stopped listening and we'll share a back to school hack that can come in handy for just about anyone. I'm Gretchen Rubin, a writer who studies happiness, good habits, human nature, and the five senses. And I am just back from our beautiful hometown of Kansas City, back in my home office here in New York City. And joining me from LA today is my sister, Elizabeth Kraft. That's me, Elizabeth Kraft, a TV writer and producer living in LA. And Gretchen, I'm just back from gorgeous Hawaii family vacation. Yeah. And I'm wearing, for anyone watching on YouTube, I'm wearing a lightning bolt sweatshirt that mom got me for my birthday. Because, you know, lightning bolts are my personal symbol because... TV is lightning in a bottle. So I chose that as my personal symbol. Well, that's great. I love that she found like a whole execution on that yes. in the sweater. Yes. Oh, that's so fun. Well, um, before we jump in, we have a couple updates and responses to previous episodes. First from a listener responding to our discussion in episode 387 of creating a five senses portrait. Yes, this comes from Katie. She says, I'm writing a book and I'm struggling to engage with the story after not being completely happy with the plot. Today, I used the five senses portrait idea to write about the city it's set in and some of the key characters. I love the place it's set, New Orleans, and writing about the five senses portrait of the city has got me super excited again. So use the five senses portrait to remove a writer's block. I love this idea. I love yes. the way people are taking this five senses thing and putting it in all these different directions that we did not anticipate. Yes. Yeah, Gretchen, you know, in Fantasy Island, we definitely play with the five senses because we're really evoking that Fantasy Island feel. You know, like that tropical drinks yes. and tropical breezes and tropical yes. flowers. And, and the, the ocean. sound of yeah. birds and the ocean. Yes. People walking on the sand. Yeah, yes. absolutely. I can see how that that's would kind of unblock your imagination. And then we got another response. This was to the listener who kept suggesting keeping a brag file in episode 390, where we had all of the suggestions for work. Yes, this comes from Jennifer. She says, I just finished listening to episode 390, where Natalie described the brag file. I learned about and started such a thing when I was in college getting my teaching degree. We called it a smile file. It was one of the smartest things I did. The collection of notes and drawings from students, parents, teachers, and administrators really grew over my decades of teaching to the point of overflowing a file box. When I got tired, worn down, and burnt out, I'd spent some time with that box, and the smiles helped me refocus focus. I retired from teaching two years ago, and as a big fan of simplicity and clutter clearing, I decided to cull the file of all but a few of the most meaningful items. Turned out I couldn't stand to throw away anything, <laughs> yet I also couldn't stand an old junky box of random stuff cluttering up the place. So I took the time to carefully photograph every single item and used an online photo book company, minus Peekaboo, to arrange them all into a book of memories of my career. I included diplomas and certificates and reviews, as well as photos of students and projects, too. I love designing those types of books, so it was a fun project that resulted in a concise, professional-looking keepsake and shareable artifact of my 30-year career. I'm so glad I did it. First of all, I always like things that rhyme, and so Smile File yes. has, has that going for it. And it is great to just have this, we talk about the ta-da list and the feeling of it's easy to forget everything that we've accomplished if we don't keep some kind of record of it. Yes. And Gretchen, you know what you could also use is your memento keepsake journal for this. I was thinking exactly the same thing. So I'm going to hold it up for anybody on YouTube. It's just, it has pockets. This is my new one, so it's totally unfilled. It has pockets where you can keep things you could stick it in and then you can write on the sheet about what's in it. Because again, as she says, it can be really burdensome to keep all this stuff around. Even when you want to keep it, it can, it can feel messy. It can feel disorganized. And so that's one of the reasons that I wanted to do this memento keepsake book, because it makes it so easy to just tuck things in. Yes. Also, she really likes the process of making the book and laying it out. I think for some people really love that, but some people do not love that. Yes. And so that's a real, if that's part of it, then they might do nothing at all. Whereas the thing about the memento journal is it's just a pocket. So you yeah. just like stick in the 
the letter from the student or the certificate or whatever. And, and then maybe eventually you make it into the beautiful book. But if you just want to keep it tucked into its pockets, it still looks like a nice, neat, professional keepsake. Yeah. Like the way she was talking about. Yeah. Yeah. I'm much more likely to just stick something in a book than I am to make a book. But that's me. Yeah. Yeah. Well, everybody's got a different way. And if you're interested in the Memento Keepsake Journal, I'll post a link in the show notes. Or you can go to just go to GretchenRubin.com slash shop and look for the Memento Keepsake Journal. And now let's, let's get into our Try This at Home suggestion. And this week, our suggestion comes from you, which is ask people how they know when you've stopped listening. So explain the background of this. How did you come to the suggestion? Yeah. So Gretchen, Sarah and I are part of a showrunner's initiative to increase diversity and inclusivity in the writer's room. And as part of that, we went to a diversity training session, which was run by a man named Dr. Stephen Jones, who has a company. And it was, you know, we've done different diversity and inclusivity training sessions. And this one was just so great. Oh. It was three hours on a Saturday. It was a whole bunch of showrunners all on Zoom. Mm. It flew by because it was so interesting and we felt like we were learning so much. And one of the exercises they suggested doing, which really got everyone talking and going, was to ask two people in your life, how do you know when I've stopped listening? Ooh, okay. And as soon as this exercise came up, everybody had just this moment of like, oh my God, I totally stopped listening at times. Everyone knew we almost didn't need to ask because everyone sort of knew in their own <laughs> heart when they what they did when they stopped listening, right. which right. I thought was really interesting. It's a good exercise to, though, kind of ask yourself, are you disengaging from the people around you, basically? Well, I think this is such a great question because I think we, you know, we've all done it, whether you are just sort of overwhelmed, so you need to take a break or you're, you just have so much more in your mind. You're like, I can't waste my time listening to you talk about this thing. I got to think about something else. So Elizabeth, can I take a guess about like what the number one tell was that people thought? Well, yeah. Okay. Was it looking at your phone? Yes. And I asked Jack and Adam because we're no longer, you know, in the room, because really I should ask people I work with as well. But I asked Jack and Adam, and that's what they said, looking at your phone. Although, Gretchen, you know, I know in my own mind that I have another thing I do when I've stopped listening. And what's that? It's if I ask, if we're talking, and then I suddenly ask a completely random question that has <laughs> nothing to do yes. with what we're talking yes. about, then yes. I'm like, oh my God, I've completely stopped listening. I'm having my own train of thought and I'm derailing the conversation in another direction. Right. And you know that someone's not listening to you because you know they've been thinking about something else. Like, did you remember to pick this up from the grocery store? Yes. Or did you remember to like file this document? Oh, that's so funny. So again, I asked Jamie and Eleanor too, because just they were around me. And they said it, that it wasn't so much about me stopping listening, but starting listening. So they were saying mm. that they had learned that they, if they have something important to ask me, they can't do it when I'm hungry or sleepy or preoccupied, mm. that they have to pick their moment because I can't respond well. And I thought, well, it makes me sound like this delicate flower, but it is sort of true. I mean, you know it, I know yes, it, it is you, true. That yes, if I you are, you're, are the toddler that needs to be, have your needs met, yes. I, I am, and, and which is one of the things that I have to give you a drive by gold star, because one of the things I love about you is I'm like in California, it's 4 p.m. and you're like, do you need to eat dinner? Yeah. It's 6 p.m., do you need to get a bed? And it's like, yeah. as a matter of fact, yes, because I, you know, because it's true, it's, it is hard to listen. I mean, I thought that was what was interesting about this discussion was recognizing it is hard to listen and we need to pay attention to being able to listen. The people around you, off, whether it's at home or at work, they can sort of lose steam, lose morale, lose a sense of purpose if they're talking to you and you're just shutting down and clearly not listening. I mean, it's not a good feeling to talk, be talking to someone and then you're suddenly like, okay, and now they're shopping online. Right, 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 right. Or now they're answering texts from executives. Yes. I worked with someone, I won't name names, but 
you knew that she wasn't listening when she was scrolling the real real. It was like, okay, yeah. she stopped listening. And so people can tell. It's not, yeah. none of us are very good at pretending to listen when we're not. I mean, that's one thing right. I realized in this discussion. People know if you're listening. Yeah. And it's really important to kind of activate that and keep it going. Or if you can't listen, then acknowledge that and set aside another time to talk, let's say. Well, one thing that I've gotten much better at is people will be talking and then I'll space out. It, sometimes it's like on task, like, wait a minute, did I do that? Or do I, right. under, you know, I'm kind of like going through my the filing cards in my mind or I just like completely space out. I've gotten much better about saying like, I'm sorry, I just lost you there for a minute. Can you repeat what you said instead of trying to fake it? Because yes. I do feel like sometimes I miss things and it's just better to say, People are very understanding. If you're like, I'm sorry, I just, I, I was thinking my own thought there for a minute. They, they're they fine with that, I find. And I feel better when I'm not just like spacing it out. But it, one of the things I thought was really interesting, because you and Sarah talked more about this in Happier in Hollywood, and I really highly recommend that people listen to that conversation too. But one of the things you said is like, it's really hard to listen when you're under time pressure. Tell people you're under time pressure. Say yeah. like, look, this has to be done by 4 p.m. So I can listen to you, but I don't have long. So that people, if you're in the workplace, like your deadline is their deadline too, even if they don't know it. And so by being transparent about like, look, I'm under a lot of time pressure here, then people don't feel like they understand where you're coming from instead of like feeling like, well, you never have time for me. It's like, I don't have time for you when this has to be done by 4 p.m. today. Right. Or like, I only have 10 minutes right right now. This can't be a leisurely creative conversation. That has to happen at a different time. And I, I thought that was just very realistic. Yes, yes. I think that's really helpful being transparent. And then also reminding ourselves, um, and this is part of the diversity and inclusivity training, to be open to other people's ideas. Because yes. sometimes we stop listening because it's like someone's talking, and you go, oh, well, that's, you know, not how I want to do it. And you just kind yes, of tune right. out. Yeah. But if you keep listening and if you keep your brain engaged, you may find that it is a good idea, that there is yes. something you want to use in that idea. But I, I do think it just takes a certain amount of awareness, yes. mindfulness, and discipline to not tune out, you know, yeah. um, it's well, easy to tune out. Well, and I have this thing and I tell people that I'm who haven't worked with me before because I, I know this is my thing. And even though I know it and I'm perfectly self-aware, I still do it. So I say to people, I will say no, you will propose something and I will say no. And I will say that can't be done. And there's all these reasons why I'm opposed to it. And then I'll think about it for half an hour and then I'll be like, OK, I can do it. I just have to do that. I have yeah. to say no. And then I can say yes. And you just have to know that it's a stage. And sometimes yes. I can even say, like, I'm going to say no. Let me think it through. But sometimes I am really convinced that I'm saying no. Uh. I, I, and I, and I, I sort of can't get in front of it. So I just try to tell people about it. I, and again, but it's part of listening. It's part of like, you're telling me to do something that's hitting me in the wrong way because it's not coming from me. Yeah. But if I want to be able to take your perspective into account, I have to be open to that. And yes. it's like, I can't be open right away. <laughs> yeah. Well, the other thing is oftentimes when someone has an idea, it involves work for you, right? Yeah. So there is also that resistance of like, okay, yeah. if I say yes to this idea, you know, in my world, oh, that means I'm going to have to change this beat and that yes. beat and this other beat yes. and it's rewriting a scene and oh my gosh. Yes. And so I'm naturally resistant just because I might not yes. want to have to do extra work, depending on yes. what phase we're in of a script. Right. You're under such incredible time pressure with your work. A I lot think of that's, the time, that's, yes. Yeah, that's unusual. Yeah, Gretchen, so it was really interesting to think about that. And then if anyone wants to hear more about this workshop Sarah and I did, listen to episode 274 of Happier in Hollywood. So let us know if you do try this at home and what you learn <laughs> when you ask a few people how they know when you've stopped listening. Let us know on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. Drop us an email at podcast at GretchenRubin.com. And as always, you can go to the show notes. This is happiercast.com slash 392 for everything related to this episode. Coming up, we have not one, but two happiness hacks. But first is break. So now it's time for happiness hacks and we're going to have two hacks. And I thought this was a great hack because it was very explicit about what to buy, why to buy this, how to use this, what to look for when you're doing this. I just thought this was full of information. Yes, this comes from Cindy. She says... 
With college about to start later this month, I wanted to share a hack that continues to be very helpful for my three daughters. I purchased numerous stackable storage totes for moving clothes, bedding, small appliances, office supplies, and other paraphernalia. The bins are easy to carry with molded handholds, and we were careful not to make each bin too heavy. We wrote the contents of each bin with a washable marker or on a strip of masking tape. The filled bins fit in my van for the move and stack neatly on the curb at the college's offload location. The unloading helpers were always quite impressed. Once unpacked, the bins and lids nested inside each other to be stored in the closet with the top bin holding dirty clothes or the stack of bins could be turned upside down and used as a table. When it was time to move, my student brought out the bins and started packing without having to go hunt for boxes. Off-season clothes and other items have been sent home with us to be returned later. One of my now adult daughters had to come home because of some health issues and all of her apartment items are stacked neatly in my attic and basement for when she's able to be on her own again. I purchased the 18-gallon Sterilite bins, which have been available for years in a variety of colors at Walmart and other retailers for $6.98 each. Other options are available, of course, but make sure they are easy to carry. Some do not have good ways to grip the bin. As college marked the beginning of 10 years or more of frequent moving for each of my daughters, these bins have proven to be well worth the initial investment. I can't believe everyone doesn't do this, Gretchen. It's such a good idea for college or other moves. Well, and she's so right. I mean, speaking as somebody who has someone who just graduated from college and is now like a young adult on the move, they just, there's so much moving in, moving out, shipping. You know, I mean, it, it just, it's a really good idea. And what I really love about this too is you need boxes. Yes. When you go to college, you need boxes to move in and you know you need boxes to move out. But with cardboard boxes, it's like, you flatten them and put them under the bed. You're but not you're supposed to bed. do that. Yeah. Right. All that. And so this, the way you can use it either as kind of a side table or coffee table or as a dirty clothes hamper. And I had no idea these were so inexpensive. That's a really good deal for something that you're going to be, you could be using for the next decade. Yes. Yes. So thank you, Cindy, for that hack. Hopefully that'll be useful to everybody sending their kids off to college. Yes. And here's another hack that we wanted to include because it's very appropriate to this discussion of like not wanting to listen anymore. So you're pulling out your phone, you know? Okay. So this is a pulling out your phone problem. Yes. And this comes from Emily. She said, my husband and I just had our first baby, so we have a lot of visitors lately. I noticed myself starting to scroll on my phone when I felt overwhelmed with the length of someone's visit or when there was some sort of lull and I just wanted to busy my hands. I really hated that I was doing this and wanted to make it a point to spend less time on my phone. I told my husband that I had a new idea, to think of my phone as a novel. If it wouldn't be acceptable to pull out a novel and start reading, I wouldn't use my phone in that situation. It has worked great. My parents and younger siblings, even my 15-year-old brother, have adopted this, and we are much more thoughtful when choosing when to pull out our phones. It also has benefits other than just using our phones less and spending more time with the people around you. We now have a jokey way to tell someone they are being kind of impolite with their cell phone. We simply <laughs> ask, how's your novel? And we all laugh and the phone typically gets put away. Last night when we were all in the car together, my mom tried to show a picture of a house to my dad. I always get nervous around phones and driving, so I told my mom... Mom, no reading novels while driving. I feel that was a funny way to also keep us all safe. I love that. Well, it's reframing, or it's, I guess it's choosing a metaphor. So like th putting perspective on it. You know, I wouldn't read a novel, so I shouldn't look at my phone. And also she said like, it's a funny way to make your point. And like, as we always say, if you can use humor, yes, that's so great. And now it's kind of an inside family joke. Yeah. But it's an important point. Yeah. It was really just a funny idea of also just picturing her with some visitor and just pulling out yeah. a novel and starting to read. <laughs> Made me laugh. The thing about your conference is like that that is something that happens. People yes. get drained or they get pressed for time and yeah. they get overwhelmed. And so they do have this feeling of starting to 
disengage and give themselves a break yes. in a way that isn't fundamentally uh, a good idea. And Gretch, maybe that's a good way to get rid of someone is just pull out a novel and start reading and they'll likely <laughs> head for the door. Right. You're like, you're like, you can't compete with Jane Eyre. Yeah. So, okay. Right. Okay, and now it is time for a listener question. Yeah, Gretchen, this question comes from CD. I'm CD, longtime listener and fan of the pod. I'm inspired by Gretchen's daily Met visits and want to go to more museums in the coming months, as this is one of my 22 for 22 goals. I'm curious, how much time do you spend in the museum every day? What is your preferred time to go? Do you take photos of the art? I take some photos and then immediately forget about them. Do you journal about your favorite art and or your experiences? And how do you manage going to the museum every day? Oh, this is such a fun question. So yes, as part of my work for my book about the five senses, which is coming out in April, I go to the Met every day that I'm in New York, that it's open. And I, I really just decided that I would keep it very open-ended. So some days I go and I stay 10 minutes. And then other days I go and I might stay an hour. Sometimes I get there and I'll be really curious about something, uh, but then I'll sort of feel like, okay, I've had enough. I've, I've taken in all I can take in, like if it's a new exhibit. And sometimes I just wander around. I have all kinds of little games I play with myself. I have something called Met Roulette. I've got this giant art book. Mm. And sometimes I'll open it up just at random. I'll look for an object and then I'll see if I can go find it in the museum. You know, read up on it and then go look for it. That's fun. Sometimes I'll, I'll try to like decide in this gallery, what is my favorite thing? And so then you sort of see things in a different way if you're like, okay, which is my very favorite but usually I just sort of wander around and, you know, I'll kind of have an idea of where I want to go and I'll go there. And you do take photos, not all the time, but but often, right? I do take photos, but just as the impulse hits me, I, I agree though with CD that I do take a lot of pictures that I then forget about or like right. I'll take a, like there'll be something interesting and like a plaque. And so I'll take a picture of it thinking, oh, I want to go back home and look up XYZ. And then I'll realize two months later, oh, I never did. I don't even remember why I took a picture of that. So I try to keep it very loose and just sort of like very much what I feel like. Now, I have to say I'm incredibly fortunate because I live within walking distance yes. of that. Which, note to self, that's what my roommate from college said. She was like, note to self, live within walking distance of the museum. <laughs> yeah. So, yes. But I had lived within walking distance of the museum for years. Yeah. And I hardly ever went. So right. that alone is not enough. And I, because of the Met... As a New York City resident, I can go for free. I did join as a member just because I wanted to support the institution. But for a lot of museums, if you join, then you can go as many times as you want. So so it's it's an amazing deal. It's also a great gift. I think somebody mm. mentioned this a couple of years ago when we were doing a gift guide. They said, give someone a membership to a museum or some other site like that. And it is a great gift because you, you can go. And my final point to CD or whoever else is thinking about this is, I really cannot emphasize enough how much more I enjoy going now that I go all the time. Mm. Something really, really changes. It really deepens an experience when you go often. I I feel like I'm going to go to the Met every day for the rest of my life. Mm. It, it, it really, and I've talked to so many people, whether it's a park or a bench or somebody even said he went to a CVS every day. I mean, <laughs> it, just by going every day, it changes the experience. It's really interesting. It's just really powerful. So I highly recommend it if there's something in your life that, that could appeal to you in that way. Yeah. And I would also mention to CD, I think many people want to go to museums more. So if you want to get together with a friend, it's a great suggestion because they're likely also thinking, I should really go more often. And it's, you know, you can look yes. at our chat and then have lunch or something. So it's a, yeah. it's a good thing to do with a friend or by yourself. You're usually by yourself, but sometimes you go with uh, a friend. And I will say one thing. So Elizabeth, you and I were raised, our parents are very much of this kind, which is like, get as much out of an experience as you can. So it's like, if we're going to go, we're going to go, 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 go. And I kind of had to dial that back. And one of the things about going every day is like, I don't have to feel like I have to see very much. Yes. To make it worthwhile. And I think, you know, a lot of people get museum legs. It's easy to get overwhelmed. And so if you go all the time, it's like, oh, I can just look around a little bit and then I'll go another time. Because if you go rarely, you feel like you really need to see a lot right. and get a lot out of the experience. And that can sometimes feel kind of tiring. Yes. 
Okay, Gretch, coming up, I give myself a summer-related demerit, but first, this break. Okay, Alyssa, it's time for demerits and gold stars, and this week is an even-numbered episode, which means it's your turn to talk about a demerit. Okay, Gretchen, so you know um, I was very excited about this summer because for the first time in so long, Sarah and I, yes. although we're still working some, kind of have the summer off, quote-unquote. And my demerit is for the entire summer, starting, you know, the day after Jack got out of school, I've been just saying, oh my gosh, it's going so fast. The summer's slipping away. How much is left of summer? I mean, I've enjoyed summer, but not as much as I might have if I could have just let go of the notion that it was going so fast. Have you ever gotten a massage and you spend the whole massage thinking, okay, I think it's been five minutes. Oh, I yes. only have, oh, now I'm, uh, now Whoop. she's doing my feet. That means I, it's probably almost over. And like, yes, you yes. don't relax because you're just thinking how much more time do I have to relax? I've almost considered whether I should say to the person, like, give me a 15 minute warning because I do get distracted by like, how much more is there to go? And like, would it help me to know that? Uh, yes. That's so funny that you mentioned it. I've had exactly that same thing. But here's the thing about the summer. But, you know, do you think that part of it is that I think we all have this, like, memory of being in, like, fifth grade. Yes. And the summer just feeling endless and, yes. like, every day being open and free. And we just always are yearning for these summers of childhood that you just don't get as an adult, I don't think. I guess you don't. Yes, that is exactly what I am yearning for. I am yearning yeah. for this, like, endless summer that Open, just, yes, and that just leisurely. lasted forever. And like August lasted forever. August yes. seemed so long. Yeah. And now I just felt like the 4th of July came and I'm like, oh my God, it can't be the 4th of July. Yes. And, and, you know, so Gretch, I'm going to try to just, you know, enjoy the little bit that's left of summer and not just constantly be lamenting that it's ending. Yeah, yeah. Now, how about you? What is your gold star this week? Okay, so we were taking Eleanor on uh, college trips, and so we were at Wesleyan, which was fantastic, but we had got the time of the tour wrong. Mm. Jamie thought it was at two. He had booked it. He said it was at two. We got there, and it was at one. Oh. And I said to him, fortunately, we were very early, but and we caught up with the tour, and so in the end, it was all fine. But I was like, please relieve my feelings by basically taking responsibility for this. Uh -huh. Because Jamie was just sort of like, what are you going to do? Sometimes you get the time wrong. And I'm like, no, you got the time right. wrong. And if it had been me, I would have triple checked it to make sure we were there at the right time. Now, he did it. And again, it's like he went ahead and did the work. And so, and I didn't have to. So he should get credit for that. But I really just wanted him to say like, oh, I'm really sorry. I just wanted him to yes. say that. And it yes. would have relieved my feelings. I said later, I, would, I gave myself a 6 out of 10. I could have been better. I could have been worse. I was okay. Once we caught up with the tour and I realized like we'd only missed one stop, I was fine and I was able to joke about it. So that was good. And I also didn't want to have Eleanor's experience of Wesleyan completely right. distorted by the fact that I had been really angry. So I was trying to keep it together. But it was one of these things where it's progress because I was a 6 and I think I might have been a 3 <laughs> So Three that's years ago, the gold turned, star. You made it. The you, gold. You climbed the the ladder to a six. Good for you. I, I'm at a six. Just keep working on it. So it's half demerit, half gold star. And there you have it. Well, that's good, Gretch. I'm proud. Yeah. Progress. Progress, not perfection. That's right. And the resources for this week. If you go to GretchenRubin.com slash shop, you can find all kinds of things there that you might find useful. In particular, because we're beginning a new school year, you might like the one sentence journal, whether for yourself or sort of like a family journal. A lot of people use the one sentence journal in that way. There's a link there. Or if you want to take a look at the Memento Keepsake Journal that I mentioned earlier, also this is can be the actual inspiration for the Mem Memento Keepsake Journal was a school journal exactly like this with pockets for every school year that our grandparents gave us when we were really yes. young. And I loved it so much for so many years that I wanted to create something like that. So as the school year started, the One Sentence Journal and the Memento Keepsake Journal are both great ways to keep track of memories for yourself or for other people. 
And you can check those out at GretchenRubin.com slash shop. And what are we reading? Elizabeth, what are you reading this week? I am reading The Paper Palace by Miranda Cowley Heller. And I am reading an, another of the last interview series. I'm making my way through them. I'm reading uh, The Last Interview with Frida Kahlo. And that's it for this episode of Happier. Remember to try this at home. Ask people how they know when you stopped listening. Let us know if you asked and what you learned. Thanks to our executive producer, Chuck Reed, and everyone at Cadence 13. Get in touch. Gretchen's on Instagram, at Gretchen Rubin, and I'm at Liz Craft. Our email address is podcast at GretchenRubin.com. And if you like this show, please be sure to tell a friend. That is really how most people discover our show, and we so appreciate it. Until next week, I'm Elizabeth Craft. And I'm Gretchen Rubin. Thanks for joining us. Onward and upward. Elizabeth, when I was in Kansas City, I was listening to the cicadas. And ever since you told me how much you love cicadas, I have now I love cicadas, too. It's like so loud and such a summer sound. I know. I could listen to that all day. So Kansas City. Thanks so much for watching our podcast here on YouTube. If you enjoyed it, please hit subscribe right below the video. It really helps the channel. Thanks. From the Onward Project.